Good evening everyone, everybody and welcome to H704 and I will now uh, start with something that is similar to what I formerly mentioned when it comes to language acquirement. This is a predecessor of that development within language acquirement that took place in tennis. And I think this could help to understand what is going on because it's actually rather complicated because it's so different from we are, how we often assume uh, the process of learning something happens. Uh, and this is from a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. The author is Tim Galway. And he says that there are actually two tennis player in each tennis player. Self one and self two. One is the conscious aspect. That's the one who says that I should learn tennis. Who wants to learn tennis and gets very happy when he knows tennis. But it's not the doer of tennis is not the one that learns tennis. So there's two different people. And as you can, can hear, it's similar with the monitoring uh, consciousness when we sp spoke about language acquisition, where you have uh, some sort of uh, uh, explicit rule system and there is a monitoring tendency that goes on inside of us. But that monitoring tendency is not the one that learns and it's not the one that uh, talks either. Uh, it can only make corrections afterwards. This is similar, but there are some differences, but I will get to those soon. Team Galway means that we need to strike a balance between the two selves. We need to be a balanced situation. We need to find ways of encouraging the doer of tennis, the learner of tennis, self too. Can I get up even to make it more clear? Self one, I'm just going to write in us that's the conscious, conscious, uh, conscious aspect. Self so two is the doer and the learner. Doer, let's put it either. Well, once again, I feel uh, a lot of uh, relation to this Tim Galway because I remember when trying to learn sport when very young, it was the same. There was one self that wanted to do the whole thing but a completely other self that learned and that self needed to be encouraged otherwise it wouldn't be working one can actually see if you go to a tennis court or golf course some professional players actually talking to the other self saying things like come on and don't give up now or something to the effect of you need to focus those things. That is actually called self-talk and self-talk is very important. Tim Galway said that could be the reason for some people being very successful when it came to learning a trait. It's also self number one. It sort of fails. That self can actually get into troubles because it wants to do things a little bit too hard and press the self too and until nothing comes out. But it's also the fact, and I remember this keenly when we got up into game and, and matches and that stuff. Uh, 
it was always this one that disrupt the game by being too tense and too nervous, too wanting, one could say. He found ways of getting around. I won't go into too much on those. But how can you stop self number one from interfering in what self number two is doing? And one of the tricks he had to get self number one engaged in stuff that was not important for the game. And this is very similar to learning a language. I told you before, if you have knowledge of the explicit rules of grammar, we know it's going to be harder you, for you to learn a language the proper way that is implicit. The only way you can learn a language. So, to help stop interference in tennis, he told the self number one to focus on the seam on the tennis ball. By doing so, he could let self number two do the job for himself without interference. And I think that could actually be a very, very smart idea. You need to have different things to do for both the selves. And that's the reason why it's so extraordinary important with all these rituals that is around tennis games, and football games and other stuff. The rituals are like the seam of the tennis ball. Without those rituals, self number one will interfere and destroy the success. So I'd say that is a knowledge that's especially uh, keen in the sport of cricket. I don't know if you if you've seen a cricket match it's a very very slow process but a lot of the process process are things that one could say looks almost not like game at all and those things are there to keep self number one preoccupied or not uh, destroying the game because cricket takes a lot of skill you really need to do certain things the right way and that will not be possible if self number one could be left to his own mood and the worst thing you can do is say I should only do the end goal I'm going for the good stuff I'm going to put the ball inside the cricket if you think that you are sorry to say that screwed directly we know that is actually an order for self number one to interfere to get into the business and when i mention this this is oddly very very similar to something completely different that has nothing at all to do with this and that's the interference by the directions in the alexander technique where we have this self number one who wants to make the performance nice not to make any misuse uh, do it elegantly balanced coordinated and that's the reason for the failure isn't that interesting well we found a common lead here Kahneman no that is Alexander yeah my Kahneman yeah also two yeah, but uh, I don't see the same. I was thinking of that, but in Canem, well, there's no, no, that would be very hard to get in here because one is quick and one is slow in Kahneman. One is very thoughtful and one doesn't think so much. I think both those are within this one, I would say, mm -hmm. because this is more of the corporeal skillful attitude and this is unconscious as well whereas 
the two cells in Kahneman that were both conscious. You could see that's what they were doing. But um, yeah, 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 well, yeah, he has two selves, it's true. Um, so there are different tricks, and most of those tricks are incredibly interesting, actually. Because that is to keep everything balanced. Another thing that he often recommended was, was to listen to the sound the ball makes. What sound does it have in the air? And that's a thing that has no connection to the game. It has nothing to do with winning. And as soon as you put self number one in that idea, things that are not important, Self number one gets occupied with it and wanting to fear. And I think the crucial thing to understand here is self number one should not do self number two's job. So let self number two do its job and let self number one do its job. They have different purposes. And I would actually say, this is, could be a guess, I think it's a guess, but I think animals don't have this problem. They don't have a self number one, they just have self number two. So they don't have the problem of destroying their own action. I could be wrong. Uh, the reason I think about that is I remember grandpa's cat and he had uh, some problems sometimes by being too uncertain. He also mentioned something being in the zone. And being in the zone is when the two selves are doing their separate jobs, not interfering with each other, letting them do what they do best. And then there is a feeling of incredible timing. Timing in the sense that everything goes in a nice rhythm. So you put the balls, you serve, everything is in a flow. And that is to be in the zone. Everything is under your control. And you notice that everything works out as you've been thinking. So this is also about not disrupting one thinking process. And it's actually a little bit as number one is doing. It's doing something in advance. Tries to do something before it has happened. Whereas self number two do things in the right order. And that is the same problem exactly when it comes to misuse. Because what does self one, number one do? Well, if you're sitting in the chair, he wants to get up as quick as possible. It has a goal. I go up, and in on the way up, I misuse myself, and I reach my end. This is obviously self number one that's interfering. He doesn't know how to do the movement. He should not be involved in the movement. But as soon as it is, it's going to destroy the face but led to be occupied of other stuff. And I think that's partly the reasons for the directions. I mentioned earlier in the lecture here that if you uh, focus on the seam on the golf, there's a seam here. If you focus on that, that one will be occupied by that and not destroyed. Maybe the directions are serving the same purpose. Because giving clear orders, this one will silent, become silent, or become disciplined, maybe it's a better word. It's giving the orders in the right speed. I think it's actually self number one who's giving the orders. But somebody tells it to do it in the right order. That was a brilliant 
idea I have here it could actually be self number one because it's conscious he has the power to put words in a specific order and we need to give them the right orders the correct orders for do every part Tim, he, he went on to uh, write. Um, ah, no, this is very good. This this performance. This is what we want to have. This is our potentiality. And here we have a minus. And that minus is interference. So what we need to do is to make the interference as small as possible. And therefore the potentiality will be higher. Now if you want to have a good idea what this is, is the obvious. Go to the billiard hall and you know this is going to happen to you just in the time you have the perfect chance of setting the ball and put it into the corner and then that bloody thought comes up. Will I do it? Or I already done it, haven't I? Oh, they are looking at me. And what happens is your shot that's going to be so excellent becomes destroyed because of your wanting to do something in advance it's not well timed the timing is off Tim, he started to work actually at a telephone company in the United States called AT&T and he used the in-game to improve working performance and he wanted to uh, improve courtesy levels in the customer service. He did take on the challenge on the condition that he did not have to mention the word courtesy. The customer voice became the tennis ball. The customer voice. voice. Mm -hmm. And the operators were asked to identify its tone, whether, say, loud, soft, angry, or nervous, and recognize the tones in their own voices. They started to measure the qualities on a scale 1 to 10. The process worked on a number of levels, not only improving the relationships between operator and customer, but providing the operator with a more enjoyable workplace, because what they were doing seemed like a game. Uh, I really like that because I've been working at customer service myself, like many students. I did my years in customer service. And you easily notice the reaction on the client with every change you do in your voice. So it's very much like the tennis ball. An essential part of the inner game process is to identify what Tim termed the critical variables, 
the elements of any situation which matter as opposed to those that don't. Another author, Matt Somers, described these clearly in the case history which accompanies uh, the article. The critical variables are not always the obvious ones, and defining them can produce some valuable insight, as well as providing guidance on how to move forward. And here is another thing. It's very important core principle. And once again, this is very similar to language acquisition. Another core principle of the inner game is non-judgmental awareness. As I mentioned in the previous lectures, uh, 702 and 703, when you have explicit rules for grammar and vocab, that will interfere with your way of producing successfully. Because that's a voice that's judgmental. It comes in just when you are supposed to do. And it's interfere with the speed and the timing. For instance, if you have a, a conversation with a couple of people, you need to first understand the meaning and then it needs to be timed. Explicit language rules both disrupts both processes, both the timing and the understanding of the meaning. And understanding of the meaning is crucial to learn the language, because language is meaning. And uh, what they try to do in traditional language training is to learn the student sort of to say a language without meaning, a dummy language. And uh, it's starting to dawn on me you know, why language training in my school did not work, because it was just a language image, something that looked like language, but lacked real situations, meanings, purpose, flavor. Well, one could say it was a dead language almost. And therefore, that knowledge could not be put in action. Because I had to produce new, new knowledge, implicit knowledge. And it was even so that the first knowledge, this dead language knowledge, interrupted in the learning process. Very interesting, actually. Because think of it, uh, learning grammar uh, is something new. We haven't done it for a very long time. Use, what used to happen if we were supposed to learn a language, you were just sent somewhere else where they taught the language. Or you improved your contact with people who actually spoke the language. So grammar thinking is very new. I think it was developed, grammar was probably developed just a couple of centuries ago. It's, it's something completely new. And uh, it's never been a part of language learning from the beginning. And I think it is like grammar has a different purpose altogether. But it has no purpose in learning the language. It has other purposes, yes. Just as the self number one has important purposes. Very important. But not do the tennis game and not learn the tennis game but all the other stuff and those that stuff is not unimportant to get the person to the tennis court to get the person uh, uh, stimulated anticipating and this is also uh, the conscious number one that do the planning and everything so it's a very important part maybe the most important but it also need to let self number two do its job. And I think 
when it comes to grammar or even better pronounce this monitoring tendency let that monitoring tendency be something you do after everything is finished I actually read a recommendation or somebody wrote on the internet just like me that person was interested in grammar and uh, he said that I want to learn grammar couldn't I learn it when I learn the language I don't care if it's useless because I like grammar I like grammar too and then he was actually quite precise he said yes you can learn grammar but you cannot learn it before you learn the language first you learn the language and then you can learn grammar and that's almost the same thing that happens when you already know a language like I'm my language is Swedish but I, I, my performance cannot be improved in Swedish that's never happened it could never be improved it is like it is but if I want to improve it step further and this I think goes to show what this monitoring proce process is if I want to do it now I have to actually go to some sort of source a rule or something like that what, what's the rule for for instance uh, when you use the word uh, where in Swedish this is a bit complex complex if there is a direction to it we use one word and if there is no direction we use another word and uh, I confound these two words in Swedish like many other people do and uh, that is supposed to be a fault and then it be, to be corrected then I need a rule but I'd say that use of language I do then that would be put maybe in a book on the internet or maybe I just say maybe I don't think so I say maybe when I hold the speech that's active corrections but it will never feel natural to me to uh, have a rule afterwards if I should use uh, where, uh, which where I should use in Swedish. We have to, you know, they're not very complicated, but if you're going somewhere, we use one where, and if you're not going somewhere, we're just asking where somebody's going, and you use another one. And uh, they can actually be pronounced the same way, so it doesn't matter really. But if you want to be extra specific, you can have the rules. And I think today, uh, this could actually be a helper here to understand uh, the whole thing. Today, that has become more important. But obviously, that could not have been important, let's say, three, four hundred years ago. Nobody would have cared. Because then, what you spoke, what was you did, there was no correction going on. Of course, Different people spoke differently because of uh, where in the country they came, which class they belonged to. But there was no corrective agency in those times. So we are actually experiencing something new. And it's good to understand it. Because if we don't understand it, we can get tricked into believing that is this constructing grammar that some sort, sort of way rules the language. Last thing I can do to help here, uh, I'm not talking so much with, about Tim Galway, well I am in a way, but the, the last helper here is that oddly enough with some languages, for instance Japanese, it's so different so you can actually construct a grammar that is completely different. So you can have two grammars for one language. There's nothing against that. And those grammars are completely different. They don't contain the same amounts of rules. The rules work differently. But they both describe the language. And actually some mathematical person said it could be an infinite numbers of grammar in a language. And isn't that amazing? This is just what David Bohm is saying. In the implicit, there can be an infinite number of explicit explanations for what you have. 
so you see this is actually helping with david bohm as well and as i mentioned before i uh, spoke with kalle here i think david bohm had this very very good intuition when it comes to mathematics he was brilliant at it and been working with it for at least 25 years when he performed his theory he was no longer aware of what he knew and therefore when he constructed his marvelous idea about implicit and explicit he knew what he was about but it's tougher for us and uh, i think it needs a lot more pedagogy it needs a lot more different angles need some more meat on the bone because what David Bohm is proposing is nothing less than a complete new take on the world and then it's not enough with a few chapters in the book you need massive books for that who helps you to lead you in the direction of true quantum physics and of course that should also contain vivid illustrations, maybe some situations taken from daily life and such. And in the end you will understand, aha, this is how it works. And little by little you further your understanding for this. There is no end point. Uh, there is a beginning but there is no end point. Because the understanding of what implicit and explicit is, is interminable. It will always grow on you. And that was exactly what he meant. He wrote as much in his book, The Holographic Paradigm. It's a never-ending understanding of the concepts as such. Uh, they just go on and they give you more and more and more. And I think uh, this sort of helps you to understand that uh, when you know there are different grammar rules you can make for the same language and also that you can go to the tennis court, you can meet up with a personal trainer and this person is extremely good himself and he will say to you if, uh, if this is golf well your swing should go the whole way up and your eyes should be on the ball nowhere else like this and you should stand equal length and you should have your buttocks relax and your chest should be open up and once you strike the ball you should no longer look at the ball but look for the horizon these are all good and helpful advice but nota bene these are explicit advice and what will happen when this person that paid maybe maybe 100 euros for his class for his lesson that's what the golf class costs he will the next time go to the tennis court or the golf course and he will not be able to put this explicit advice into practice. Actually, he will tense up. He will definitely tense up. He will have no use for it. And the first reason is that way too many advice. Ten advice is way too much already. One is enough to keep in head. So this is this confinement of explicit and implicit. So what, uh, what is needed here is a complete different pedagogy when it comes to golf and tennis as well, not only language. And that does actually exist. And oddly enough, uh, I remember now when I'm saying this, that I have actually been exposed to this. Uh, I learned to handle the shooting stick uh, one day and there was this uh, fellow called Leif and I said, how, how should I do? I said, don't do anything, just take the shooting stick in your hand and what I want you to do is to point at the pigeon, point at it and whenever you feel, you pull the trigger. And I did that and the, the pigeon just and the second pigeon, I wasn't taught anything. The only thing he adjusted later was to put the butt of the shooting stick closer to my rib cage. I wouldn't get any pain in the long end. Just point to the pigeon with your shooting stick. So it's 
almost like knowledge is a sort of hologram. And in this little thing, follow the pigeon with a shooting stick. That was enough. Because that little thing, that little instruction contained the whole game and left nothing out because every single table he took it. And I could actually see people standing next to me getting instructed from another person and that person said to them, hold your shoulders equal length, keep the eye on that, don't hold your breath, <clears throat> and so forth and so forth. And they all missed. And the second round we got a little better, but I never got as good as I did. And I remember I got back, maybe a year later, and I couldn't do it anymore. I was gone. <laughs> I'd never been able to perform that way again. That happened just then because he was so abrupt to just say, just look at pull the trigger. I think that goes to show. I think this is a good time to end this uh, very interesting subject and I say to you, have a very pleasant evening. Bye. Thank you.